Hello and welcome back to Learn Linux TV. In today's video, I am going to review this laptop right here, which is a Latitude E6430 from Dell. And the thing is though, that this is actually, well, it's an old computer. In fact, it's quite old. So why am I reviewing a computer that's from 2012, you might ask? Well, the fact is, I love to review new computers, but not everyone has over a grand in US dollars just lying around, and not everyone can afford something that costs that much money. Sometimes you just need a laptop that runs Linux. You just need maybe something to check your email on, something generic, or something that still runs decent enough to where it's not tedious. And in this video, which could become a series, the goal was to find a laptop that was lower in cost than 300 US dollars, and I settled with this right here. I bought it from Facebook Marketplace and decided to run Linux on it and then tell you guys about it. And the idea with this potential series, I'll do more videos if you guys want me to, is that in each episode, I will feature a different computer that you can buy on eBay, Facebook Marketplace, or wherever you buy used computers from, and let you guys know how well it runs Linux. So is the Latitude E6430 a good choice? Should you go out and buy one? Well, let's go ahead and take a look. Now, first of all, I wanna get the obvious point out of the way that the E6430 is a very strange looking laptop. Starting with the E6420, which continued with this model, the E6430, Dell decided to do a strange experiment. They actually redesigned the Latitude line completely and they designed it around strong materials such as magnesium alloy. And to this day, I'd argue that these models are among the strongest and sturdiest that Dell has ever produced. After the E6430, they continued using at least some of the magnesium alloy, but they kind of started to go back to the old way of doing things. But I really like how sturdy these laptops are. Yes, they are much heavier than any other 14 inch laptop, but they're built like tanks, and they're especially good for kids, for example, who are possibly accident prone. And the E6430 is so strong that I feel like it could probably withstand an accidental drop to the floor. But no, I'm not telling you to drop test it or anything like that. It's just built very strong. I also like the rubberized feel of the palm rest. It just feels nice. And nowadays, I'm not aware of a laptop that's available new that actually has a rubberized feel like this one does. I think it's great. The keyboard is actually one of my favorites. This is before the chiclet style took over every model, but this laptop actually came out in between the migration in the industry from the standard laptop keyboard to the more chiclet style. And I have to say, I really like the keyboard on this model a lot. When this model was new, you could order it with a backlit keyboard or a non-backlit keyboard. So if you do want a backlit keyboard, make sure you check that before you order it. Now, what I think the major downside is when it comes to this model is the screen in more ways than one. First of all, the bezel is ridiculous. It's among the thickest bezel that I've seen in this line. And that's interesting because two models before this one, it actually had a thinner bezel around the edges of the screen. So when I first saw this model, I kind of felt like, wow, this is like a very ridiculously large bezel. And it is. Now, after you use it for a while, you tend to really not notice it. But when you first see this laptop, it probably sticks out like a sore thumb. There's just a lot of wasted space on the screen, and I don't really like that. Also, the screen quality is a bit on the terrible side. When this model was new, Dell and even Lenovo, they didn't really put a lot of effort into having very good screens on their business line of laptops. It's almost like they felt like business people didn't really need a good screen or something like that. I mean, it's not an IPS display, but they even had better non-IPS displays back then. And at this time, it was often the case that if you ordered several of this model of laptop, that the screens wouldn't look the same on each because it seemed like Dell actually sourced their LCDs from different factories. So it was kind of a roll of the dice as far as how good the screen is going to be. But thankfully, the screen on this model is extremely easy to replace if you want to upgrade it. Now, on my end, I actually decided to try several distributions of Linux on this laptop. I've tried Debian, Ubuntu, and Pop! OS. 
because the obvious question here is, does it run Linux? Is the hardware compatible? Contrary to popular belief, not all hardware is compatible with Linux, and before you buy something, it's very important to check that first before you order the device, or buy it used in this case, to make sure that everything is compatible. So let's take a look at how each distribution fared. Now, first of all, Pop! OS and Ubuntu. And I'm going to lump these two in the same segment because, well, the performance was pretty much identical between the two. And the main issue that I've found with running a GNOME-based distribution on this laptop is that even if you do get the model that had the higher screen resolution, it's still a very low screen resolution by today's standards. And as much as I love GNOME, I just don't feel like it's a good fit for anything that has a screen below 1080p. And this particular model was not released with a 1080p display at all. When it was new, you were able to order it with a display that had a resolution of just 1366 by 768, or you were able to pay a bit more and upgrade the resolution to 1600 by 900, but neither resolution is all that great for today's tasks. And to make matters worse, this particular laptop that I've purchased has a watered down screen, and that's one of the downsides about buying a used laptop. You could have something that's defective or partially defective, and the screen was actually better than this one in screen clarity, even if you had the worst screen that they made it with. And that's one of the downsides about buying any used device. You just don't know what state all of the hardware components are in. And even if you ordered this laptop new with the worst screen that they had available, it would still look better than this one does. But again, the screen is easy to replace. So due to the fact that the GNOME experience wasn't that great, given how much screen real estate GNOME actually uses, I also decided to try out the Mate edition of Debian as well, which I feel is a greater fit on this machine because, well, you get more screen real estate. It just doesn't take up a lot of screen room for all of the components of the desktop environment. Now, out of the box, everything works on this model except for the Wi-Fi card. On all three distributions, the Wi-Fi card was not detected at all. And if you were to go to the network settings section on any of the distributions that I've mentioned, you will find that Wi-Fi is just not an option at all. Now, thankfully, this particular problem isn't very hard to fix. On Ubuntu, for example, all you have to do is go to Additional Drivers, and once there, it'll actually detect that you have a Broadcom network card, if that is what you have, and then offer to install the driver for you. Once you do that, and then you reboot, Ubuntu will have access to Wi-Fi, and it works just fine. And Pop! OS has a very similar procedure. You just go to Pop! Shop, you just go to the second tab on the top, and then you'll have an option to go ahead and install the proper driver to get Wi-Fi working. And from that point forward, you'll have no problems connecting to Wi-Fi. Now Debian is a bit of a special case because it doesn't have a helper utility like Ubuntu and Pop! OS has to facilitate the installation of proprietary drivers. So you have to do a little bit of manual work in order to get that going. Essentially, all you have to do on Debian is just connect an Ethernet cable temporarily, enable the non-free repository by adding the non-free keyword to the sources.list file in the Etsy apt directory, then you run apt update, and then you install the proper package, and then once you do that, you're all set and ready to go, you reboot the machine, and then you'll have Wi-Fi. Now, a common forum post that I see when people ask for help is how do I get Wi-Fi to work on my device? And usually the answer is basically something like what I've just mentioned. You have a driver that you need to install, you install it and you're good. But I have a simpler way to get Wi-Fi working on Dell Latitude laptops, especially those that ship with the Broadcom chip. Basically what I do is I just remove it and then I replace it with a supported Wi-Fi adapter that works out of the box. So what I did, was I ordered an Intel Wi-Fi card, and it only cost a little more than 10 US dollars, and then I replaced the Broadcom chip that it came with, with the Intel card. And I have a very, very special place where I put all of the Broadcom cards that I have in my laptops for safekeeping.
Now you can't always replace the Wi-Fi card though. While it is a very easy thing to do on Latitude laptops, at least on this model, some vendors like HP and Lenovo will actually lock the boot process if you attempt to do this. So before you replace the Wi-Fi card, just make sure that you can. But as long as you are not using a laptop that has that lock-in, then, well, the easiest way, in my opinion, is simply throw the Broadcom card in the garbage where it belongs and then add an Intel card. They're very cheap, so why not? When it comes to performance, the E6430 seems to perform very well even by today's standards, which is even more surprising when you consider the fact that it released around 2012. But the problem, though, is that this model came out during a very transitionary phase when it comes to laptops. For example, you were able to buy this model with a spinning, slow hard drive or an SSD, so that alone is going to make a big impact as far as how well the machine holds up today. The model that I purchased has an SSD inside, so that was a very big win for me. So if you do order one, try to get one with an SSD if you can. As far as the CPU is concerned, there were a few different CPUs that were shipping with the E6430 when it was new. The one that I picked up has a third generation core i5-3340M CPU, which runs at 2.7 gigahertz and is a dual core CPU with hyperthreading. So when you check something like the system monitor in your desktop environment, it'll actually show up as if it had four cores. Now, when it comes to graphics, the E6430 shipped with an optional NVIDIA GPU Intel was standard, and the model that I have here has an Intel GPU, and I don't have an NVIDIA model to test in the studio right now, but when I actually tried the NVIDIA model back when this model was new, I did have problems when I ran Linux on it. However, it's very possible that those issues have been solved today, but this laptop came out around the beginning of the time when hybrid GPUs were first coming out, so Again, this model did come out in a very transitionary stage in the market. I would recommend that you try to get an Intel version if you can. Even if you do get the NVIDIA version and it works well, I'm not sure if the NVIDIA card that shipped with this model would actually make that much of a difference today. So I would recommend that you stick with Intel if you can. When it comes to memory, the E6430 has a maximum of 16 gigs of RAM. And honestly, that's not all that bad. Even nowadays, we still have computers that are shipping with eight gigs of RAM and also 16 gigs of RAM. And 16 gigabytes by today's standards is, well, passable. Now the model that I purchased came with six gigs of RAM. So what I did is I went onto Newegg and for around 75 US dollars, I was able to max out the memory on this machine. And unfortunately, that does kind of put the cost a little higher than I would like when you factor in the cost of a memory upgrade. But considering that I paid about $250 for this and the memory cost $75, I was still within the $350 limit that I set for this series. And also consider the fact that I replaced the Wi-Fi card with an Intel card. So you can add about $15 to $20 if you count shipping which takes me right up to the ceiling that I'm allowing for this series. But even if I didn't upgrade anything, this machine was fine as is for just $250. Now normally, I would talk to you guys about battery life because anytime I review a laptop, you guys generally wanna know how good is the battery? And the problem is, I don't know. This is a used laptop and I think that's one of the major downsides about this is that you are gambling when you buy a used laptop if you are concerned about battery life because you can get a great battery that lasts a long time, almost like brand new, or you could get a battery that's completely zapped of all life and doesn't work at all. You are rolling the dice, you are gambling. Now this particular model that I have here lasts me about one to two hours on battery, which is pretty good considering it's a used computer, but that's not an official metric because I might have been able to get three hours out of it if it were brand new. And again, you are gambling when it comes to buying used computers in terms of battery. Now, another thing that I'll mention is the sound quality is fairly decent on this model as well, which is a win. Most of the laptops that I review have, well, kind of terrible sound. 
The E6430 is not going to win any awards, but I do feel that the sound is decent, and I am going to say that that's a win for this particular model. Now the main question though is, do I recommend this laptop? Should you go out and buy an E6430 if you were to find one in the market used and it's available? And honestly, yeah, I do recommend it. Now obviously you're not going to play some high-end games on this machine, and you're certainly not going to edit video either, but if you just want a generic computer to test out Linux distributions on, browse the web, I think it's a good fit for sure. And especially if you have kids that are homeschooling, given that this machine is so durable, it might be a win in that regard as well. And another thing that I like about it is that it actually supports a hardware docking station that you can get for about 30 US dollars used, and it can essentially turn this machine into a desktop, which is pretty cool. Now let me know what you guys think in the comments below. I do have one more laptop that I plan to review within a couple of weeks for this series, and I don't know if I'm going to keep this going or not, but if you guys are interested in this subject and you want to know which older computers are still worth using today and are compatible with Linux, maybe I'll consider keeping this series going. So definitely let me know your thoughts. I look forward to reading what you guys have to say. And subscribe if you haven't already done so. Click that like button if you like this video. And then I'll see you again real soon. Thanks for watching.